office within um, and digital, which is in essence one of the offices. So I look after Leeds, um, so part of the Northern Hub. So I'm going to do a quick little bit about and digital, what we're about, um, and then we're going to leave you with Andre to talk about UX for day one, um, tactics and strategy. So this is our fourth Elevances um, series that Jess has pulled together, um, and more to come, and more to follow in coming weeks. So again, just, just look, watch out for Eventbrite and um, obviously we'll send out notifications on LinkedIn, etc., around these events as well. So um, let me quickly talk about and digital. So we are about just over five years old now. Um, we're around about 700 employees and been on a fairly rapid growth. Do they think he's at the end of the ooh, yeah, so about 700 people. Um, we are based across the UK at the moment. So uh, offices in Edinburgh, Halifax, Leeds, Manchester in the north, and down south, um, Reading, um, and various locations across London. So, you, you, you muted me again there, I think. Hopefully caught that at the right time. So yeah, we, um, so offices across the UK, um, we've got plans for around about uh, 60 clubs globally. Um, we've made circa 35 of those being in the UK. So we're on a fairly rapid growth agenda for the next five years. Um, so if we jump onto the next slide, I'll talk about a little bit about what we do. So we in essence do two, two pieces. We um, like a lot of uh, technology, agencies and companies out there, we, we build digital products. That's the, you know, a big element of what we do. But we do it with a slightly different lens in that we build our clients' capability alongside that. So our reason for being is to build our clients' um, digital capabilities. So we have a real firm belief that every business needs this in their DNA to operate going forward. Um, so when we work alongside clients, it's with a view to ensuring that we leave a sustainable base once we finish, whether it's a bit of a mobile app or a web app or whatever it is. Um, we then upskill and uh, skill up the workforce and help, you know, in essence, set up their whole digital culture and digital ways of working um, over a period of time. So we think we build digital capability and the best way to do that is by building products alongside our clients. Um, jump on to the next bit. That sort of splits again how we do that. So we've in essence three elements to what we do. We have a core consulting team, which are in essence advisors around the whole digital space. Um, and they tend to come in with clients and help them almost set up the ways of working, you know, the org design, you know, the structures and get the strategy set in the right place um, alongside the sort of CXO level to really drive that agenda. Because again, we're firm believers that this needs to be sponsored from a CXO level to be a real success. Um, so the guide element is, you know, short, sharp engagements to get us set up and get the things set right. The bulk of our business is in the build space, which is in essence where the clubs come into play. We, we work really closely with our communities um, to really drive, uh, you know, close relationships with our clients. Each club tends to work with around about six to ten clients and really build a deep partnership with those clients to, you know, obviously build that capability within the regions. And obviously we do a lot within the community as well. So we, we, we built the business around the sort of best companies agenda, best companies, that's the Sunday Times element. So again, independently assessed, make sure we really look after our people. And again, in specific for the North, we're pushing the business for good agenda specifically quite hard as well, the B Corp side. Um, so again, um, the build bit is the bulk of our business. And then that's supported by the teach element, which again is really important part of the capability build. So the academies and the coaches that come on site to work with us and uh, help, you know, build not just our people, our clients' people up and, uh, you know, intervene where we need to intervene to grow it. So um, as part of that, obviously, we cover all the various digital pieces, whether it's, you know, the development side, the analyst side, Scrum Masters, um, data science, UX, uh, cloud, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which leads me nicely onto Andre, who is one of our gurus in the UX space and uh, is going to lead you on to the next piece. So over to you, Andre. Andre, I need to unmute yourself. Thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks, Malcolm. Um, hello, everyone. 
Uh, welcome to UX for day one. My name is Andre and uh, I'm a UX lead, part-time cyclist. That's the bike right there. And I uh, hope you've got your caffeine fix this morning because we're jumping straight in. So many years ago when I was starting out as a designer, I was interviewing for a role at a um, large multinational agency. And I remember the creative director there, a very nice lady, and she uh, started asking me some questions along the lines of, so how would you defend this piece of work in front of clients? How would you create a rationale that would compel your clients to accept your, your solutions? And I didn't get that job, but uh, that thought kind of stuck with me because um, I, I came across it again and again. So um, people like, or famous designers uh, from the 20th century, for example, um, Massimo Vignelli, Paul Rand, uh, and many others had a tension, right, between creative thought, so the bit where designers go away for a few days and come back with a super, super creative solution, which you absolutely have to implement, and the bit where you're looking at creating an argument, creating a set of structured ideas to, to present uh, your solution. So it's that tension we're talking about in, in today's session. So before we kick off, I'd like to take 10 seconds and ask you to think about your favorite animal and just put it in the Zoom chat. Just 10 seconds, no overthinking, <laughs> and let's see what we have. Okay, right, it's blowing up. So frog, dog, armadillo, monkey, wolf, cat, meerkat. Nice, great. So I'll show you what I had. This your animal? Uh, so obviously I'm not David Blaine. And for those of you who said cat, I think this kind of covers both. Um, so what happened there? Well, I took a guess, right? I said people might like dogs and um, I got your feedback. That's what, that's what happened. So let's uh, break that down a little bit. My initial idea was people in this session like dogs. I was gonna test it by just asking you via chat. And then if more than 50% of you, 50 of you said, yeah, then happy days. Um, now in practice, with structured thinking, we want to minimize uncertainty, right? Take the magic out of it. So eliminate that need for a rationale, you know, selling your work to clients in that way. The work speaks for itself. So it's a more scientific approach instead of taking those instinctive decisions. So what does this experiment mean? Um, do I create a website with, you know, happy two hours? Do I start tell, selling t-shirts or uh, include that in my branding? None of the above, actually, because um, it's not focused. It lacks an MVP in that sense. And um, more importantly, it lacks the why. So we'll get in more detail, but that's the core idea we'll be talking about in, in the rest of this session as well. So in terms of where this is coming from, I'd like to give you some context as well. Now, it starts way before Karl Popper, um, you could go all the way back to Galileo. So he conducted a thought experiment where you would look at two objects with different weights. So mass is different, let's say a feather and a ball of steel. And he said, you know, just put those at the top of the tar of pizza. And if you tie them together with a string, you would realize that if, if your claim is that, uh, that the heavier object falls quicker, then the lighter object is going to pull the other one up, yeah? And in a sense, that would also mean that, well, both objects would have bigger mass and they would fall faster. But if the lighter object is pulling the other one up, that couldn't happen. So it doesn't make sense. So that's the experiment um, he, he created. And it's the root of all scientific thinking. That's where Karl Popper comes in. He's a famous Austrian philosopher. And his whole thing was about um, the theory of knowledge. How do we actually get knowledge? So he argued it's always knowledge of 
something it, it's not just knowledge in, in general so um to get that knowledge what you need to do is ask yourself questions hard questions and through that struggle you actually gain knowledge so as an example if i'm a um physicist i'm uh, not going to understand nature just by observing it i'm not going to measure the temperature see where the sun is no what i'm actually going to do and it's much better is to create an experiment so a guess really um, let's say my guess is there's going to be a solar eclipse if that happens great if not i need to rethink my theory um, and there's a much much longer line between Karl popper and the present day of course um, Lean UX for startups is one example. Um, there's the whole thinking um, from Toyota, lean manufacturing, and obviously all the stuff um, from Eric Ries as well. Um, but it's all concentrated around a structured way of doing things. Some of those methodologies are perhaps too complex for day one, but our focus is going to uh, be around simplifying that whole thinking. So. In a, in a nutshell, we're talking about the problem space, the ideation, and then the testing. That's, that's what we're looking at. Um, and it might be worth saying that um, we're dealing with unscientific methods all the time. Things are happening that are outside our control. Gustave Flaubert had a quote around how language is like a cracked kettle on which we um, beat our tunes on to for the best to dance to so um, at the same time we hope to move the stars for pity um, it's a nice way of saying um, we don't really have a clue right so that's where structured thinking is really important um, let's give an example in terms of how we actually approach a real scenario um, Let's say you've got a, a banking gap and you realize you've got a problem with onboarding and the other bit is how do you know it's a problem well you might say research tells us that okay but what specifically about research is it terminology is it colors is it branding is it something else let's say it's terminology so what are you going to do about it well one of the ideas might be just simplify it right trim it down um, maybe you do away with onboarding altogether. Um, so a bunch of ideas. And then towards the end, you also want to put in a measure uh, to test that. So you might do that with uh, a quick uh, A-B test. Um, you might do that with uh, standard usability testing. So uh, a range of methods to test your ideas. But with this, we're not talking about marginal increments, meaning uh, it's not A-B testing in the simple sense in that, you know, change a color, change, uh, change a font. It's broader, uh, wider, wider changes we're looking at. So we talked about hypotheses for a bit and structured thinking as well. Um, the other part of this, and it's a really important one, is the team. So on day one, and pretty much any day for that matter, teams are faced with a lot of challenges, right? Um, decision making, leadership. Um, how do we communicate? How do we work together? Um, engagement, right? Um, confusion abounds in many, many scenarios. So um, you have to think about uh, how you approach users, how you approach stakeholders. What if someone is blocking you? What if we all start thinking in the same way because we've always done things in the same way, right? So group think. So loads of challenges. But to punch through those, you need a set of principles and that's what I've got there in terms of uh, key areas um, so it's not about features it's not about adding a drop down to your app it's about actually delivering an outcome for users making their journey easier and the other points around collaboration and share learnings are also very important teams work much better when they share when they have a common vision a common goal um, the thing with these principles is the teams should come up with the ideas behind them, as in uh, it empowers the teams if they do it. And as an example, I've included some principles we use at hand. And these are just a few of them. I'm not gonna go in detail, but simple and flexible as an example. Well, that means our approach is simple enough so people can just pick it up and, and use it. 
doesn't have to be complicated. Um, GDS, and that's the government's digital service here in the UK, um, has an excellent set of principles, as an example, and that enables them to get feedback and keep projects on track across a vast multitude of, of things, of, of layers or, or organizations. So the bigger you are, the bigger your challenge, the more important these principles uh, become. Okay, so we'll look at a quick uh, example. Let's say you've got a mobile app and you've got a bunch of features, search, gamification, categories, and so on. You're not really sure what you're trying to achieve. And um, here we're looking at gamification because uh, in this context, it's probably the, the, the meatiest conversation, meaning uh, some of the other ones are pretty run of the mill, meaning search, that's useful, right? We're gonna implement search regardless. Um, whereas gamification could be a game changer. So um, you want to look at that first. So you do it by testing with a prototype. So this could be an interactive, clickable prototype, a design prototype that is. And then once you have positive feedback in relation to that, you move to a coded prototype. So in stages, increments, right? Um, and then success is how you actually know you're right. So 3% increase means it's successful in this case. There's more than one way to phrase these hypotheses. Uh, another common one is we believe that dot 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 uh, this will achieve that dot 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 and we'll test this by doing this and that dot dot dot. So different ways of doing it, but this is the core. You're looking at hypothesis, test, and success. So I uh, don't want to be doing all the talking in this session. I would uh, I'd like to hear from you as well. So. If we could take 30 seconds and just put in the chat one hypothesis, a way to test it, and how you measure success in relation to a new product. It could be your product, any product, but really how you approach this in a structured way is what I'm after. So uh, I'll put some music on as well, just give you a chance to think through some of these and then we'll pick an example or two. And again, don't overthink it. It's just whatever, whatever you think uh, works. Sample there from Sammy. Okay, good stuff. Okay, maybe give one more example and then we'll draw a line there. So I'll stop the music now. And let's, uh, let's see, we've got uh, this one from George in terms of delivering a service. And um, that gives us an indication of how successful we are. Test by delivering service fast, medium and slow. And we, we measure it by the revenue we get. That's a, that's a really good one. So as an example there, um, in terms of hypothesis, what you want to do is also be really concrete, meaning if it's hard to track, if it's, if it's too complex, you might um, not achieve what you're trying to. So in that example, um, if the service is too complex, right? If you have too many strings attached to it, you don't really know where the revenue might be coming from. But it's, it's a really good example there. Um, Simon, would you like to uh, talk us through your hypothesis? Yeah, I, I have a theory that cute dogs um, basically sell. So I was thinking maybe we could, we could run a little experiment, take a small number of client engagement, and on the first engagement, you bring a dog, pretty like your picture from the start, mm -hmm. bring that into the meeting, just measure 
you know does does that have an impact on mm -hmm. you know, follow-up meeting something like this mm -hmm. okay i don't know if anyone will go for it but <laughs> it's a thought it's a really good one um, and obviously again you've got multiple variables there as in maybe the person uh, carrying the dog or leading the dog is a factor maybe the meeting room is a factor so again you want to isolate those as much as as much as possible but a really good one and maybe here one more from uh, Craig Craig do you want to take us through your example there uh, yep sorry um, just doing the unmute thing yeah so this is more about um, you know promoting a specific product so will a hero banner at the top of a main page for example Mm -hmm. Will that uh, drive more sales towards a, um, a, a critical product that we're choosing to promote? Yeah. Uh, you can test that in a, like an A-B testing mm -hmm. uh, scenario, maybe on a specific segment in a specific area, maybe. And, uh, and hopefully with the uh, success factor of increasing sales. That's, again, a really good one. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Um, with... Uh, these examples, you're obviously um, approaching A-B testing to a degree, and with hypotheses in, in broad strokes, you want to keep it uh, well high level as well, as in try and um, reach all all the different levels, not necessarily just the, the front end or uh, the, the back end. Um, so that's uh, that's part of it. Okay, so we'll move on. Thank you very much to, to everyone. Um, now, in terms of a framework, we're looking at the bit on the left where you have needs at the top and then business value. You want to marry those two up and then when you start aligning them, you come up with themes. Those themes will start emerging naturally and you also want to prioritize them. I'll talk about prioritization in a bit more detail, but from those, apologies, you end up with your hypotheses, which is what we, we discussed previously, your, your idea, your test and then how you measure it and those hypotheses can be aligned to your backlog that's where the real power lies you want to keep track of those through the backlog and obviously feed back into your hypotheses so it's a loop right it's the classic uh, loop you want to align to all these experiments and importantly you can you can feed hypotheses into this triangle shape here which is separate from your backlog but also straight into the backlog so two ways of doing things um, wh whichever one works for you and I've also added some numbers just to make it clear. Say you've got a hundred great uh, ideas from users, maybe they're pain points, maybe they're opportunities, insights from previous research. Um, and then on the business side, you might have another hundred great ideas, right? So when you, when you combine those, you end up with, with themes in terms of which are more important, how they're uh, better adapted to your business and so on. And then towards the end, when you move to hypothesis, you want to simplify things as in uh, 15, 20, that's probably too many, right? It's just too much to keep track of. So you want a, a limited number of hypotheses to take into uh, your sprint or take into uh, a delivery state. And uh, speaking of simple, there's a, there's a way to pivot as in you might look at this uh, point here and realize, oh, maybe I want to turn a feature of my product into a separate product altogether. Uh, maybe with this one, you want to explore a different set of customers. Say you've got uh, millennials as your core audience and you want to branch out to different audiences. Um, maybe you want to look at your strategy five years from now. What does my product look like in, in five years? Or maybe you want to transition into a, a native app or React app whichever. So there's nothing stopping you from running multiple uh, experiments in parallel as long as you keep uh, track of them. Um, with pivoting, you want to start thinking about that when um, you're playing defense, right? When the, the market's too crowded, when you, got, you want to explore new opportunities, so that whole uh, blue and um, uh, red ocean thinking. Um, so so that, that's helping uh, with that. Obviously, senior managers in organizations have KPIs and performance metrics links, linked to the, this quarter here, or maybe next quarter as well. But having uh, the opportunity to run these experiments gives you flexibility in that as you prove your hypotheses, as you demonstrate value with those, you can bring them in as features. Uh, 
into your main part. Okay, so in terms of um, prioritization, there's many ways of looking at it. I've listed a view from the product side and then the UX side on the right. Uh, so with products, we can approach things from a value perspective. Uh, so let's say a user journey is more valuable than search, but then search might be quicker to implement. And then there's also a combination of the two. What is the opportunity cost if we implement one or the other? Now on the UX side, we also care about um, human elements. So these categories are things you want to align your hypotheses to. Um, and this bit here is just the sliver that you use as an MVP. So a good way of doing this is to hit the entire spectrum. You don't want to be talking about functionality only or just emotional bits because you might be too, too shallow in that sense. So another example here is in terms of branding. So emotional bits, let's say some nice illustrations, warmer colors, a nice tone of voice, something in relation to branding would uh, link to this criterion. Um, this one is about um, how usable our product is. So let's say you've got 20 categories on the website or maybe too many menus in the mobile app uh, and just reducing the number is gonna increase that uh, well, usability, user us satisfaction, right? And then on the functional level, let's say you're targeting accessibility. So it's, um, maybe increasing the font size, maybe just changing some bits around the button sizes. So it's those small changes that make a big impact for users. Now, there's also a risk versus value categorization. So all those hypotheses you generated back on the previous slide where we had the, the framework there, um, you want to align to a risk and a value coordinate. So that way, you know, the riskier and the more valuable the more you want to look at it, as in back to gamification, that's, that's pretty risky. We don't know if it's gonna work, but it's also a lot of value. So that's why we want to, to look at it because it's somewhere over there. You also want to ask yourself, is the problem big enough? Uh, is it chunky enough, right? Um, does it cover all these areas um, in, in detail? And then you might be onto a winner. I. Um, also wanted to give you a, an overview in terms of how to bring it all together. Meaning teams are being set up every day, challenges abound, organizations are pretty complex. And this is how we look at things in the end. Um, on, the right, on the right hand side, we've got the, the whole ways of working, which I won't go into, but this bit here is the user-centered design cell, meaning your hypotheses and your structured thinking, among many other things, of course, but um, that's what feeds into your, your backlog in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, coming up with those uh, improvements, right? So you can see that they're separated, but at the same time connected. So it's that dual track mentality we've, um, we've all come across in the past. So ultimately, what I'm proposing is this, um, simply get started. This workshop can take 32 minutes or a full day. Um, as for the workshop, workshop itself, I've got one word to describe it, and that word is post-it. <laughs> and uh, not just because of the time limitation, but just putting our ideas in writing has a lot of power. You're not losing track of ideas and you're getting input from the entire team that way. Also, you might have time to go through all the ideas in detail. So that's why tracking everything from the very beginning uh, is, is important. So what does this look like in practice? You've got 10 minutes and then I'll suggest take seven minutes to write everything down and then kind of put those on a board for everyone to see. And that's your needs, your insights from business perspective, uh, your, your goals. So it can be uh, all that we covered in the, in the first uh, part of that framework. Next, you've got your themes. So when you start moving these on that, on that uh, prioritization scale, we, we discussed in terms of risk and value, that's when your themes and priorities emerge. And then you formulate those into neat hypotheses, just like we did in the chat earlier. So what's your idea? What are you gonna do to, to test it? What's your test scenario? 
and how are you going to measure it? So KPIs are really, really important because without, without those, we're, you're actually running on empty. I mean, it's great to come, come up with ideas, but if you're not really going anywhere, then what, what good is it? So there's a few more things this uh, workshop actually gives you. Um, there's team alignment. So the team actually works together. They understand the goal that they're all on the same page. Um, you also have uh, initial epics, as in uh, the, the stuff you want to put in the backlog initially. You might already have a, a very clear roadmap, or may, maybe you don't, but this, this gives you a sense of direction from a user perspective. So it works in conjunction with your product thinking. It, it supplements that. And hypotheses and all these KPIs, you can track by the, the backlog, but also you can track them via more standard um, UX artifacts, such as personas. Put your hypothesis next to those personas. That's, that's a very nice way of understanding who's getting what from all your, all your work. Who are the users that actually benefit from all this? Um, there's also a, a couple more bonus points. One is you track things efficiently. That is, uh, when you go back to senior leadership, there's again a very clear way of tracking all this. And I think the final one, and this is again a really important one from our perspective, is having permission to experiment. So at this point, day one, you're just investing 30 minutes. Obviously you can put in more time, but it's not a big commitment. So easy, just, just start doing it. Don't need to be an expert at all. So we talked about a lot of things. Um, we talked about um, hypotheses, a way to structure your thinking, um, a way to work through different types of challenges. Um, but with all that, it's important not to overthink. So let's stay nimble, right? Things are not getting simpler in this world. Um, they're always getting more complex. So uh, let's, let's get started. I mean, book that workshop. Don't need to prepare for it. You've got a structure. So 32 minutes it, it is all you need. Um, the bit about empowering the team goes back to principles and how teams actually organize themselves. So setting up those core ideas, how we want to do things, that's what uh, enables teams to, to be successful. Um, I think in management, uh, people management that is, we've got a simple view around having a, a strategy, having a vision, and then having a team. So once you've got those, those three things set up, you're good to go. And principles link back to, to strategy. So how, how we actually do things. Um, in terms of being bold, I think we're not put on this earth as humans to muddle through onboarding flows or reset passwords or just read content on the web. Um, Hollywood actors have a saying, you're only as good as uh, your previous roles. I think in our space, um, in, in this UX space and creative space in general, uh, you're only as good as your next idea. So if what we're doing is just use some off the shelf solution, uh, a template of some kind, um, well, I, I don't have great news. Um, <laughs> in other words, if your hypotheses and your ideas are not bold enough, um, maybe you need to go back to the, the drawing board. Oh, apologies, could you go mute for a sec? Thank you. Um, so finally, um, we do this for users. So in my opinion, we're all very lucky to be part of the last generation uh, to, to experiment free right, before machines take over and uh, optimize everything within a, an inch of existence. So um, it'll be a long time before artificial intelligence actually uh, achieves the same level of understanding of human psychology, of behavioral economics, in the same way we, we can um, just by having a five minute conversation with our users. So let's start there. And I'll take any questions, comments, or notes.
If you'd like to put your questions in the chat, um, I have one for you, Andre, if that's okay. Um, if you work in a large organisation that's got many, many stakeholders, what would be the biggest challenge in sort of adopting this approach? Hmm. I think it goes back to bringing everyone on the same page, as in people need to understand the power behind this thinking, behind a structured approach and behind tracking things at the same time to actually make progress. So if you can get most of those people, the key people in the room, take them through this and get them to uh, actually put some of those hypotheses on paper. So have them, have them um, test those, right? Have them you know, put some post-its up there. They should start seeing where it's leading. So that's how I would approach it. Uh, large organizations are also made up of people. So if you convey your ideas to those people, it's, it's a straight path from there, is my view. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to look at one of the questions in the chat, if that's okay, because I can see the chat now. So, Alex says, how can you measure the confidence of the test of your hypothesis? How do you know it isn't just a coincidence? Good question. So there's a correlation there between uh, the level of fidelity on the one hand and your confidence on the other hand. Meaning if you have a paper prototype and you put it in front of people, that gives you a certain amount of confidence. If you have a coded prototype, more confidence. If you have something where people can actually put their car details and buy something, even more confidence. So that's how I would look at that. That correlation um, tells you it's not a coincidence. If people pay for it, not a coincidence. Uh, so hopefully that answers your uh, question, Alex. Um, I think Amy put a question around, uh, does this approach need a different take for larger scale digital products, um, i.e. from scratch, where everything is from the ground up? Um, and yeah, absolutely, Amy. Um, this is just intended for your first stab at things, day one, where chaos abounds and, and nobody really knows anything. Um, so large organizations and especially projects in general benefit a lot from some of the other methodologies in the UX arsenal, such as design sprints, innovation labs, uh, design thinking in general. So yes, absolutely. You need robust tools for projects. This is meant as an activation piece. This is something quick you can really put out there without too much thinking, without a lot of preparation. It's just to get things going really. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, and uh, just looking at, Simon's question, a project where it would not be a good idea to do hypotheses, test and iteration from day one. Hmm. I, uh, I have trouble imagining that type of project myself. Um, perhaps if you're talking about uh, creative projects um, and back to that uh, observation from really early where you talk about famous designers that uh, have this genius mentality and uh, we all have to uh, adopt it or understand or you know accept it so maybe those kinds of projects don't need hypothesis it's just one creative genius coming up with the the entire uh, uh, lineup for a fashion show um, so those types of approaches uh, might, might not need a structured approach um, and uh, i think i don't know how we're doing for time but um See, we've got one from Adam. Um, what do you do in an organization where you don't have access to users? How do you build empathy? Hmm. Yeah, I think as designers, as UX specialists, it's really our responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility, really, but it's also ours more than anybody else's. So um, in one way or another, it's something you, you make happen. If you don't have access to real users, what about bringing some people with some knowledge of the subject? So SMEs, your product owners, for example, are not omniscient, right? They might know the market very well, 
they might be actual users. But sometimes it's like asking uh, someone who, who uh, has a very refined palate when it comes to pizza, asking them, um, so how, how do we build a pizza factory? So uh, users are, are super important. Um, you don't need big budgets to, to actually get feedback from users. Just put a survey out there, quick to get, get some people willing to, to listen to you. So time is, is really what you need. But without empathy, you're, you're again, kind of running in circles. You, you need that to happen. Uh, that's really the foundation. Um, okay, and uh, I think we'll take one more question unless I'll, I'll uh, take one more question here. So let's see, practical challenge. Would you um, propose a hypothesis against some preconceived notions at client level as they might have some analytics to drive in their view? Okay, so let me see if I get that right. Six. Um, so clients with existing analytics might not care about hypotheses. Yeah, right? Right. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that can happen. Um, if you have data, if you already have a clear view on what it is you're trying to achieve and you, you're tracking it, you might, not, you might not need to go overboard with creative thinking, with innovation. So you've got a website, it's all about conversion, it's all about uh, keeping those users on that cart journey and not uh, you know doing anything crazy so maybe that's a, a good way of of doing it i think uh, the other point with all this is scientists over the years and since the beginning of time really have always said you know we can't say for sure this is absolutely what 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 we should do right so you always have that level of maybe there's another way of doing it a better way so um, going back to um existing notions or data they already have clients that is um you can use it this can run in parallel as in again you're investing a workshop you're investing a few hours of your time it's not derailing existing analytics so it's just adding more detail to that um but again putting people in the room having them take a crack at some of these challenges um through that simple approach might just tell them or show them that, yeah, there's no risk. Let's let's do it. Um, okay, so I think we're ready to wrap up there, Jessica. Unless there's anything else, um, I think we'll s send out the recording just uh, in a few days, I believe. And uh, if there are any other questions, notes, comments, please uh, drop me an email. Reach out to anyone from uh, uh, the fine. Uh, client acquisition team at hand or um, just in general in LinkedIn. And yeah, hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much for joining and have a great rest of the day. Well, thank you, Andre.